any words, but let's go straight away to the central propositions which will direct our long and unbroken historical discourse. First, that in those two centuries that transpired from the first third of the 17th century to the first third of the 19th century, the capitalist mode of production became the driving and indeed the most shattering force in world politics. That in the second place, the conquering bourgeoisie, that mercantile bourgeoisie most predominant in those expansionist states of the Atlantic coast, began to amass unprecedented stockpiles of capital and eventually to come to control and arrogate for their own profit those new forces of capitalist production. In the third place, that those liberal revolutions of that era, by which we mean conspicuously that great English upheaval of the middle of the 17th century and that great French cataclysm of the 1790s, that those liberal revolutions created the juridical and the institutional foundations for an expansionist market capitalism. And fourth, and most important in terms of the demonstration that we want to make, that the conquering bourgeoisie, concerned after all with great passion to protect and to buttress its power and authority against the pretensions of a refractory and indisciplined working class, created, after all, the ideology in the society and that system of repression which ultimately succeeded in buttressing that power. So that liberal ideology, or what we call the classical liberalism of the bourgeoisie, which trumpeted, after all, so facilely during those great liberal revolutions of the 17th and 18th centuries, the beginning of an era of liberty and equality, that that liberal ideology in its most primary function buttressed and pronounced and protected the inviolable right of private property, so that the prerogatives of property and of profit began to run roughshod began to ride herd over all of those collective conventions, over all of those earlier habits of work, over all of those social norms of pre-capitalist society, which Edward Thompson, in a felicitous phrase, has called the moral economy of the poor. So that the implacable and abstract laws of the capitalist marketplace what Richard Tawney once called the political arithmetic of the capitalist era, began to dominate and to regulate the lives of masses of men and women, reducing them, if you please, along with their environment, to the status of commodities of production, usurping from them the fruits of their labor, and at the same time rendering them passive in the process of work itself. So that in the final analysis, there was a shattering and a destruction of that social framework of protection which men and women had traditionally clung to in order to protect themselves from the ravages of unprecedented private property. You see, what we are saying is that something happened of a great historic importance, a mutation of great historic importance between the 17th and the 19th centuries, what Karl Polanyi has called the Great Transformation, that historic interlude, after all, of very real economic acceleration and just as real cultural cataclysm when the social rapport and the social relationships of human beings and the moral values of human beings disintegrated on the capitalist marketplace. We're talking about that profound rupture in social practice to which Andre Pietre has called our attention in an extremely penetrating book called Les Trois Ages de l'Economie, The Three Ages of the Economy, when Professor Pietre distinguishes between what he calls the économie subordonnée, the subordinated economy, and the économie dominante, or the dominant economy. 
For by the subordinated economy, Piatra means those economic systems of pre-capitalist societies whose practices, after all, in some manner, however imperfectly, reflected the moral code and the customary usages of the community. And when he talks about economy dominant, or the dominant economy, he is talking about the economic system of the emergent capitalist societies in which the purposes of profit and of production at any cost ran roughshod and transcended any other moral and cultural and psychological consideration. In the final analysis, we're talking about that radical and, if you please, traumatizing impact of bourgeois liberalism. Or to put it more precisely, we're talking about that radical and revolutionary change which liberalism wrought in the conception and in the prerogatives of private property. Because you must remember that over long ages, from antiquity through the 17th century, it's one successive society after another, that even the governing classes and their ideologues treated private property as a social convention. In other words, as an institution which society itself had created and consequently which it could control, which it could limit, which it could even abrogate in the interest of some transcendent good, whether that be the service of God, whether it be the preservation of the social organism, whether it be the protection of the poor. But the bourgeoisie and its liberal ideologues in the emergent capitalist societies did not treat private property as an artificial convention. Instead, they came to treat it as what they called a natural and inviolable right, that it was an institution that predated the organization of society itself, that was born in the state of nature, that consequently conferred upon man and upon the uses of property a naturalness and an inviolability that made it immune to any kind of social restraint or social coercion. So that liberal ideologues, so that the great spokesmen of liberalism not only ignored but ultimately disintegrated all of those institutions of social sanction which communities had traditionally established in order to protect themselves against the ravages of private property, so that now the atomistic individual, detached, if you please, from the community itself, serving only his own profit and his own ego and his own self-interest, was rendered free to accumulate, to dispose of, to use his private property as he saw fit, regardless of the consequences that that accumulation and use might have upon masses of men and women and upon the human environment in which they had to live. We are talking about cataclysm. We are talking about profound transformation. And how is it, after all, that we fathom the depths of that great transformation? How is it that we can come to grips with this project of liberal capitalism, which liberated a property elite from all social restraint, which liberated it to do what it would with its property? How to come to grips with that? Perhaps it would be well, in the first place, to pause, if even briefly, to underscore in general the critical importance of the institution of private property, of ownership, and of accumulation in those societies which are anchored in a regime of unequal private property, so that we understand in the gut, in the viscera, and in the tripe,
so that we understand that the quality of life in such societies, or even the possibility of life in such societies, perforce reflects the way in which the material goods of those societies are concentrated, distributed, and used. And then, with a somewhat longer foray into history, it would be well for us to pause and to traverse long centuries of the past, to go back even to antiquity and to march through to the 17th century, to find out even cursorily how those societies previous to the dominion of market capitalism viewed and treated the property institution so that we come to understand what a profound transformation the modalities of market capitalism involved, and not less so that we come to discover, perhaps for the very first time, that in history there has been a long and unbroken tradition of protest and subversion against the excesses of private property and even against the institution itself, which has been mounted by the deprived poor of previous societies. And are we laboring the obvious if we say that we are concerned to underscore the importance of wealth and accumulation in societies based upon unequal private property? No, no, no. I think not. That you see, it seems to me that we have become wholly unaccustomed really to reflect seriously about the institutions which are most dominant in our own lives. Think how very readily we come to accept as perfectly natural and the norm the most questionable institutions. Think how readily we accept the most outrageous social arrangements and consider them somehow to be the norm. Did we think about the institution of private property these recent days when we read in the press that the undue harshness of the winter had destroyed one third of the citrus crop in Florida and that as a consequence, 150,000 or so migrant farm workers, shorn of any resources for their survival except their bare labor power, were suddenly forced into an existence lived at the most jagged edges of sheer chaps. And did we think about the property institution when we discovered in that searing book of Susan George about that unprincipled power of agro-capitalism over the food supply of the world, that in any six-hour interlude, on any day of any week in this world, that 2,500 adult men and women starve to death? And so we must make the point about property and its power even if we make it briefly and generally. Because, you see, when we look into the past, even cursorily, at the societies that have gone before, or if we cast a glance over most of the societies in the contemporary world, we are clearly struck by the fact that private property is the great divider between human beings and between social classes. That it is those, after all, who have arrogated to themselves a substantial quantity of private property, who have arrogated to themselves considerable wealth, who constitute one side of the social scale, and who are, after all, free of any great fear about want on the morrow. And they are distinguished from the mass of men and women in most societies who, lacking either considerable or any private property and wealth, don't really quite ever know whether they will make it on the morrow. What we are saying is that in its most accessible form, the importance of private property in societies 
based upon that institution. The importance has to do with security. That the rich, after all, don't have to worry about starvation. And that's critically important in most societies. That they can protect their children against the dread of want. That they don't have to take jobs that they don't like. That if they choose to do so, they can free themselves from the drudgery of alienated labor. That if they are so disposed, the rich can surround themselves with an environment which makes of life something of an artistic thing. That if they are so disposed, they have quick and ready access to the traditions of Western culture. Oh, look, I don't mean to say that the rich necessarily or even generally will live meaningful and creative lives. Others may tell you that, not I. But it suffices to say that in living in the kind of society that we do, which is so rich after all, imperfectly counterfeit and meaningless and boring plastic pleasures, we know perfectly well how utterly stupid and meaningless the lives of the rich can be. Nor do I mean to say that from the ranks of the poor there will never be those who cannot rise above that squalor and really reach incredible creative heights. We have examples of that replete in the history of the working class movement. We have examples of that in the history of Western culture. But you see, the point is that we can't exaggerate and we can't romanticize. If it is true that there are an occasional number of poor who manage to live very meaningful lives, let's face it, most of the time, masses of people surrounded with squalor and tied to that kind of burden of alienated labor and tied to the crisis, after all, of sheer survival, can't do anything but live at those animalistic levels. And if the rich live stupid and meaningless lives and just as ugly as the gargantuan automobiles they drive, if that is true, then nonetheless they are free of the burden of insecurity. The insecurity which paralyzes the personality, which corrodes social relationships, which makes life a perpetual misery. We will criticize, as we should, the superfluity of consumer goods in our kind of society. We will criticize vulgar materialism. But when we do, we must never forget that there is nothing more vulgar Nothing more materialistic than grubbing for bread every day. And it's the point that my old comrade Wright Mills made in that book, The Power Elite, when he cited the wisdom of an old chanteuse named Sophie Tucker, who once remarked, I've been rich and I've been poor, and believe me, rich is better. <laughs> But it isn't only security. We talk about the importance or the power of property in society, of wealth and accumulation. And we're talking also about power. And perhaps we're talking especially about power. Because in regimes of private property, there is a division between a property elite, which disposes of considerable power and a mass of humankind, which is the mute object of that power, and most frequently its victim. And you see, we are talking about power that really is extravagant. Power that is so extensive that an elite of a few in society can come to regulate the lives of even millions and come to debase the environment in which those millions must live. We're talking about power so heady and magnetic and attractive that the bourgeoisie and its ideologues have invented no end 
of theories in order to defend not only the institution of private property, but its perpetuity. We're talking about power so lethal and dangerous that its control or abolition became the central issue of the revolutionary movement of modern societies. And why lethal and dangerous? And do you understand that in your tribe? Because you must remember in the first place that when we talk about a property elite that disposes of power, we are talking in any society about very few human beings. We are talking about power concentrated in a numerically small number of hands. And we are talking in the second place, after all, about power that is unrelated to the fulfillment of duties or to the possession of virtues. Because you see, in the property elite, those who dispose and use power may, after all, have no special virtue and generally don't. Such an entrepreneur, for example, may be the fortunate descendant of that mistress of the Restoration, King Charles II, to whom was given a royalty for every ton of coal mined on the Tyne Valley. Or that entrepreneur may be the descendant of the most unscrupulous money lender who battened on the misery of the poor. And remember in the third place, that that power is exercised through a state, that it is the state in regimes of unequal private property which becomes, in a sense, the instrument of the property agent and which bends its legislation and institutions to meet the needs of that elite. But consider most importantly that when very few in a society control the instruments of production that perforce the economic order will be irrational and planless. We're talking about capitalist economies in which, after all, production has no relationship to need in any particular specific sense. In which, after all, what is produced isn't based upon what is socially discernibly useful, but is based upon what will sell and what will profit. We're talking about those capitalist societies in which, after all, entrepreneurs may build luxury housing while housing for the working class goes a begging, in which the state may budget for great military expenditures and advances while medical care goes a begging. All of that, you see, we understand. <coughs> and we must remember. Because fundamentally what we're saying is that there is a use, uh, there is a motive in the production of goods in these societies which is specific and concrete and which is simply profit and that for that profit anything may happen and anything has happened in these societies. That the property elite in pursuit of profit have adulterated products, that they have wasted and exhausted veins of natural resources, that they have corrupted parliaments, that they have combined to raise prices artificially, that they have, after all, gone into the third world and brutally exploited the laboring masses of those areas. Yes. And yet, there is something unstable about it. And that power which is exercised then by those who are the property elite and that security that they enjoy, that all of that causes them, forces upon them, imposes upon them constant vigilance. Because all modern capitalist societies are riven between antagonistic classes and consequently there is a constant alert 
to prevent the refractory and undisciplined laboring classes from invading the property, invading the prerogatives of the rich. And so it is that in these modern societies, that property elite, concerned as it is to prevent that law, to uh, pre impose that law and order, to prevent that invasion of its property, becomes rich in the ways of repression, rich in the ways of ideological imposition. That what it does is to deploy finely honed instruments of repression, finely honed instruments of ideology. We're talking, if you please, about the use of physical force, that constant appeal to the constabulary and to the army to crush the strike activities of workers or to break up demonstrations in the street. We're talking about the even more persistent recourse to what I call legal coercion. I'm talking about those sophisticated legal codes, those property codes, the finest instrument of the liberal age that meted out such draconian punishments against any invasion of the right of private property. We're talking about the regime of prisons so that the most pathetic violators of the property code, the ones who stole because they had to eat and survive, were sent to prisons in part in order to be retrained and retrained to come out into society once again disciplined and able to work within the capitalistic marketplace, but in part also so that they were out of sight so that their very crime against property didn't prove and didn't demonstrate so visibly that the whole society was based upon theft. And we're talking about those mental institutions of the liberal age, about which Michel Foucault has written so brilliantly in Madness and Civilization. Those mental institutions where the mad were sent those who cracked up and became insane before the rigors, after all, of the market society and were sent off to those new mental institutions. Why? So that they should learn and admit their guilt. And the guilt, after all, their failure to know how, their failure to be willing to play the game of the capitalist market. <coughs> And in the final analysis, you see, we're talking about that persistent effort of the capitalist bourgeoisie from the end of the 18th century on, that persistent effort to discipline the reserve army of labor into a reliable industrial workforce. The transformation of what Louis Chevalier once called the classe dangereuse, that nomadic class that came from the villages, that wasn't sedentary, that wasn't disciplined, to convert that dangerous class into a class laborieuse, a laboring class, sedentary, dull, disciplined, obedient, accepting. To transform the vagabond of the 18th century, the wanderer from the village, the mondiant, the beggar on the road, the one who left the village because it was overpopulated, because if there were enclosures, because there was no longer opportunity, and wandered perforce into the city to convert that beggar, that wanderer, accustomed to that errancy, to convert him into the industrial worker. And there, the war played its part. And there is the Napoleonic Code written in the first decade of the 19th century, which says in one article that the primary duty of every citizen is work, and which says in another article that mendiance, that begging, that wandering is a crime punishable by prison. And so you see what capitalism is based upon institutionally in the 19th century, that the factory and the prison will go hand in hand, 
that together they will insert, they will integrate, they will discipline the refractory and the undisciplined and make them the producers of the wealth of society. And you see, you have to ponder that a little bit. And you have to pause about that a little bit. And you have to think about what the human cost of that integration into a dehumanized capitalist production was <laughs> upon those who had been wanderers and those who had been refractory and those who had been accustomed to the village before you really fathom the power of the capitalist elite and fathom the importance of the private property upon which they rested their power. Consider that you are talking about the breaking of human beings. That you are talking about people, after all, who were peasants and artisans, who were accustomed to living in the outdoors, who were accustomed to errancy, who were accustomed to yielding to needs for indolence and needs for leisure. And they were forced into the city. And in the city, they were disciplined by the imperatives of the marketplace. They took their jobs in the factory. They were riveted in one place, forced to work those 15-hour days, to go home to those ugly working-class quarters, no longer part of a community, alienated, uprooted, anomic, and more than that, bombarded and pulverized ideologically, told that that 15-hour day was their guarantee of salvation in this life and their guarantee of salvation in the next, pulverized ideologically, told that their human worth and their sole mission in life was to perform that god-awful work. Think about that. But repression, we know about repression. We know perhaps less about ideological hegemony. And that's the other side of the coin. And that capitalist elite, that property elite, so rich in honing the instruments of, of repression, no less inventive in grinding out theories to show the legitimacy of the regime of private property, and more than that, its inviolability. And you hear the arguments over and again. And there is the psychological argument, and it is propounded over and again in these liberal societies. And the psychological argument in defense of the legitimacy of the private property regime goes something like this that human beings need an incentive in order to work, and that the only incentive that really is fruitful is the incentive of the promise of acquiring property, is playing to the acquisitive instinct, and that the labor that is then produced in, per in pursuit of that property is for the good of society, because human beings will work only if they think they will profit, and in doing that for their own profit, they contribute to the social good. It is Bernard Mandeville, that liberal ideologue of the early 18th century, who put it in the Christmas formulation that private vices equal public goods. That that private egoism of the individual ends up with the good of the whole society. Oh. <laughs> spurious from beginning to end. <laughs> spurious, after all, if you stop and consider that, that labor contributes to the good of society only if what is produced is related to the good of that society. That, after all, those who manufacture poisonous gases for war may work very hard and amass great profits, but only the bizarre few would consider them great contributors to humankind. But something more than that, this whole psychological theory is really built on a very strange and warped 
and narrow and capitalist reading of human nature. It is that human nature needs the drive of personal acquisition before anybody will do anything. It, after all, ignores those bodies of evidence which indicate that men and women in other kinds of cultures, under other sorts of cultural influences, will produce and create and work assiduously for purposes that have nothing to do with market gain and with personal profit. And it is to that theme that Karl Polanyi, after all, dedicates some of the most telling pages of that brilliant book, The Great Transformation, because he talks, after all, about those simple societies, about those primitive communities in which work goes on by a rhythm of other purposes and other motives than private gain. Or consider what Thorstein Veblen told us so very brilliantly in that book, The Instinct of Workmanship, written more than 50 years ago, when he made that very important distinction between work and labor, so that work is something creative, something that human beings may want to do and work very hard at and do for long hours because it brings them pleasure, because it creates something as distinct from labor, which is alienated, which is gross, which is boring, which is monotonous and dehumanizing. Oh, and so we have the ethical argument and the ethical argument which we hear by the liberal ideologues runs something like this, that private property perforce is the reward for human effort. It is the reward necessary because human beings put out, because they make an effort. Ridiculous. Ridiculous when you stop to think of the huge numbers of human beings who put out effort all the time. Those migrant farm workers in Florida and who get nothing in return for their effort. And certainly not vast accumulations or vast amounts of property. And so then the argument shifts a bit. And it is not reward for effort, but reward for ability. <laughs> yes, but a certain kind of ability. The ability to make money. <laughs> And so it is that in Balzac's In his Young Calgary, in that great novel Lost Illusions, he talks to us about a writer and about a painter who create nobly and virtually starve to death, while the vendors of literature and art, the ones who play the market, wax wealthy. But no, the most fruitful argument that the liberals put forward was the one that was inscribed in their most sophisticated political theory. The one that came first from that great liberal ideologue par excellence, John Locke, to whom we will return over and again in our discourse. But that is the argument of political theory that private property, after all, represents a natural and inviolable right. And why Locke works it out this way in the, in the aftermath of the English Revolution of the 17th century, in his second treatise on civil government. That after all, private property exists in a state of nature. And because it exists in this abstract state of nature, because it is part of man's natural environment and natural habitat, that that private property Anti uh, predates society and cannot be violated by it, says John Locke, the supreme power by which he meets the state can in no way interfere with private property without the express consent of the one who might be violated. And it's all so benign in Locke. Because, you see, there is this lovely state of nature. And there are these lone, atomistic individuals. And they go about, and they have the problem of sustenance and survival. And so they pick up acorns. And they pick up apples. And occasionally, tufts of grass, as he says. 
and consequently when they mix those acorns and those apples and those tufts of grass with their labor and with their sweat, those acorns and apples and tufts of grass become better. But Locke knew better. Locke lived at the end of the 17th century, and he knew it wasn't about acorns and apples and tufts of grass, that it was about huge estates and about huge mercantile fortunes, and that what he was pouring into political theory was already the commonplace of great capitalist farmers who wanted no restraints against enclosures, and was certainly the rank and uh, was certainly the attitude of those merchants who wanted no restraints. By, in behalf of the artisan or in behalf of the consumer against their mercantile practices. All of it, all of it became the religion of liberalism, that it existed in the state of nature, that human beings had mixed it with their labor, and it was theirs by right. Ah, for that you need a good cynic. In 1908, there was one. <laughs> And that was Anatole France. And Anatole France, genial, sarcastic, satirical French novelist. And he wrote a novel called Penguin Island. And Penguin Island is, in Anatole France's terms, a kind of veiled history of civilization. Very funny, and very precise. And he gives us a much better interpretation of the origin of the property institution and how it is maintained than picking up acorns and mixing them with your labor. Because you see what Anatole France did, a very funny thing, didn't he? He writes the history of civilization through the history of an island. And it is an island where a silly old Breton monk named Mayel went in search of converts. And he got to that island, said Mayel. He found only paintings. <laughs> so he converted them. <laughs> and having converted them, taught them all the institutions of humankind. They were running around naked. And so he raped the female penguins in claws. And only then did rape set in. And they had been running around with communal property. And they began to settle those affairs themselves. And it goes something like this. Now one morning, as the blessed Mayel was walking in the valley of Clange, in company with a monk of Yverne called Bullock, he saw bands of fierce-looking men, who had once been penguins, loaded with stones <laughs> passing along the roads. At the same time, he heard in all directions cries and complaints mounting up from the valley toward the tranquil sky. And he said to Bullock, I notice with sadness, my son, that since they became men, the inhabitants of this island act with less wisdom than formerly. When they were birds, they quarreled only during the season of their love affairs. But now they dispute all the time. They pick quarrels with each other in summer as well as in winter. How greatly have they fallen from that peaceful majesty which made the assembly of the penguins look like the senate of a wise republic. And then, Bullock, my son, why, why are they murdering each other in this way? And Bullock answers because he's smarter than my own. From a spirit of fellowship, Father, and through forethought for the future, for man is essentially provident and sociable, such is his character, and it is impossible to imagine it apart from a certain appropriation <coughs> of things. Now, those penguins whom you see are dividing the property among themselves. At that moment, the holy Mayel clasped his hands and sighed deeply. Do you see, my son, he exclaimed, that madman who with his teeth is biting the nose of the adversary he has overthrown, and that other one who is pounding a woman's head with a huge stone. I see them, said Bullock. Yes, they are creating law. <laughs> they are founding property. They are establishing the principles of civilization, the basis of society, and the foundations of the state. While the monk Bullock was pronouncing these words, a big penguin, with a fair skin and red hair, went down into the valley, carrying the trunk of a tree upon his shoulder. He went up to a little penguin, 
who was watering his vegetables in the heat of the sun and shouted to him, your field is mine. <laughs> and having delivered himself of this scout utterance, he brought down his club on the head of the little penguin who fell dead upon the field that his own hands had tilled. At this sight, the holy Mael shuddered through his whole body and poured forth a flood of tears. And in a voice stifled by horror and fear, he addressed this prayer to heaven, Avenge, O Lord, this innocent penguin sacrificed upon his own field, and make the murderer feel the weight of thy arm. Take care, Father, said Bullock gently, that what you call murder and robbery may not really be the defensible institutions of war and conquest. Those sacred foundations of empires, those sources of all human virtues and all human greatness. To reflect above all that in blaming the big penguin, you are attacking property in its origin and in its source. I shall have no trouble in showing you how. To till the land is one thing, to possess it another. And these two things must never and have never been confused. Well, you see that an echo of Rousseau in the second discourse on the origins of inequality, in which Rousseau says that the greatest criminal of history is the first human being who said mine and thine. It is an echo of Plutón in the middle of the 19th century, who, in answer to the question, Est la propriété, what is property, answered la propriété, c'est le rôle, property is theft. But it is also an echo of a very long and old tradition in human history, which looked upon property as something potentially terrifying, that it bestowed too much power on the one who possessed it, that it was a conventional institution to be watched and to be regulated. One other note on the question, to say it now and drop it for the rest of our discourse. There is yet another interpretation of property, and I let you do with it what you will. It is the Freudian interpretation of property. And it appears in a marvelous book by one Ernest J. Beagle Hall, who is a Freudian analyst of this question. And it turns out that to the Freudians, the property or the acquisitive instinct the trait of acquiring property is closely related to the excessively anal retentive personality. <laughs> that after all, that anal retentive personality begins with an inordinate desire to hold on to its own excrement. <laughs> and consequently, when that excrement finally comes out, begins to play with it as an infant knowing no better. It is then told, after all, that that excrement isn't such good stuff for playing around with, and consequently, it plays around with the next nearest variant, which is mud. And mud, after all, dirties a great deal, and certain taboos and inhibitions are then imposed, and it plays next with sand, and goes to the sandbox, and in the sandbox begins to see that sand sparkles, and then begins to look for colored pebbles that sparkle, and then, as that infant, made all retentive to the core, grows up, those colored pebbles turn into coins, and coins into bits.